All right, guys, communion, Sabbaths, and choirs. We're going to have a sit down and chat about these because these are the quickest way to ruin somebody's playtime and ruin their time in Dominions, but also one of the quickest ways to get you into some magical paths and spells that you thought otherwise were impossible. Now we're going to discuss why even bothering with communions, Sabbaths, and choirs. Primarily, the only reason you bother is when you can't cast the spells in the late game any other way. Some spell you need to win the battle, some massive battlefield-wide spell, something you just really need to win and you can't cast it any other way. The reason you wouldn't want to is it's less efficient, slower, more costly, and trust me, if you can't avoid them, you should. But if you need one not knowing how, can and will lose you a game or two. And again, guys, I'm just here to make this simple for you. I don't want to make this super complicated, go into super deep depth or crank out any large amounts of numbers for you. I'm just going to give you a couple example battles between Marverni and Niflheim. If you know that matchup, it's a nightmare for Marverni. So I'm going to show you the basic battle, then I'm going to show you a battle where Marverni hops into a communion and wins the battle, and then I'm going to show you a battle where Niflheim counters the Marverni communion with their own Sabbath and wins it again, just to show you how it could make all the difference in the battle. Right after that, I'm going to show you a quick overview of the basic items that'll help you out in a communion, as well as going over a couple of quick spells that'll help you out if your communion masters cast it and little tricks like casting it and then hopping out of the communion in ways that I'll show you. And then finally at the end, I'm going to show you a super secret that you legitimately should not share with anybody. It's the ultimate secret. Seriously, don't tell. And here is step one, talking about why sometimes you need communions to cast battlefield-wide spells. We're going to look at what happens with Maverni, Marverni. We have a large army here, a bunch of boars, war horses, pony knights, slingers. We have noble warriors, a couple good commanders, and we're going against a large Nephil army that has light infantry in the front, followed by Bondi, which aren't great, but they're good enough. And a couple Nephil giants thrown here and there. They're pretty expensive. Nephil Jarls with a couple items in the back. And we're going to watch what happens here to our poor Marverni without their communion spells. You can see the Nephil line is holding the front. And they are spamming skeletons. Just as more blocks. And this is sort of what battles look like without major battlefield spells. Marverni loses. 353 troops lost versus 176. None of the Nephil giants died. None of the Jarls died. Only a couple of the Bondies, a couple of the Herdmen, mostly just the light infantries. All right, and now our first example of a massive communion just to get a bunch of major battlefield spells. We did the same battle, but now we have a couple of our mages casting communion spells. Now, what we did to make this simple, because I didn't want to go through the trouble of scripting too many things, is if you look in the back here, we have the blue gentlemen who are communion slaves because of this item I've given them, the slave matrix, automatically makes them a slave right off the bat. Just makes it easier when you're doing a video. We still have the same troops, same exact army, same small army that's about to get stomped. However, we have a couple of our mages set scripted to cast a couple protection buffs on our entire army, and we've got a couple guys that are set. Well, regardless, we'll see the spells as they come out. There we go. Now all of our boars have natural protection plus five, which won't help them at all, but that's all right. Soldiers of Steel, regen, power of the spheres. So we've got a lot of guys getting a bonus to base protection. There we go, army of bronze. Protection of 22 now. These guys are even protection 20. Even our barbarians are protection 18. What is this guy doing out here? Maybe he shouldn't be out here. But that's okay. He's about to drop some pain on them. Pretty much everyone has good protection. Boar Warriors now have 25, so we're doing good with protection now. Let's see what else we can do. Soldiers of Steel, we cast Doom. So now if you look on Doom, every single one of the enemy army is cursed. And now they're taking more permanent afflictions, very unlucky. We cast Doom, we cast Hail of Serpent Fangs. So these little slingers that were doing absolutely nothing before, now they have poison missiles. So if the opposing team doesn't cast poison resist, we're gonna be doing some actual damage with those guys now.
we now have Howl. So now wolves are starting to appear around the battlefield edges and come rushing in. There's our poison slings flying everywhere. The battle looks like it's going a lot differently than last time. Here's a wolf showing up and charging the back line. Here we go, some more wolves going back to distract the mages. Cause them a problem of at least distraction so they stop casting their spells. That way we can work through their front line. Evil giants, even with regen, are pretty easy to beat up if you curse them and just surround them, beat them up. We also have relief now, so every troop we have is getting one fatigue reduction per turn, which obviously is helping. Let's see how our communion feels. Fatigue only 42. Fatigue 60, the antlered one, I don't believe he's a slave or a master, I think he's just spamming spells. That's the difference, 96 fatigue. Here we go, a slave with 81 fatigue. He's one of our worst slaves, lowest paths, I mean. Fatigue on our major masters is zero, and they have weapons of sharpness going on a couple guys, so our communion's relatively safe. We have a lot of slaves and very few masters, and we're just casting the right buffs to cut through this protection of the giants, poison them and then just swarm them as we work our way through. And keep in mind, this is not with super late game research in the ways that we need. This is just kind of a generic comedian I set up to show the difference it makes in a big battle. Even these relatively weak spells because if you really look, we have regeneration, Nephil Giants, in the cold fighting us, and we're going to die, as we showed, if we don't do something. And then getting a communion, a stable communion like this, is going to make it so that our communion masters can just keep pumping out valuable spells. And you see, none of the fatigues are getting up in the 200 range, so nobody's taking any damage. That's the key. That's what makes it safe. They can just keep spamming spells to their heart's content. And they eventually whittle away with the poison. So this time we only lost 111 troops. They lost 284 of far more valuable troops. But you can see how even an impossible battle of giants, because a lot of times a doom stack like this will end a game for you. But if you put together a big communion like that, you can pull out some spells that really give you a big difference. Now I'm going to try to do the reverse, where I'm going to go on the Nephil side. Since we now know the Nephils lose this battle, I'm going to go on the Nephil side, throw in some mages, do a Sabbath, and try and show a blood way to respond to this. All right, now we're going to show a mediocre version of a Sabbath counter, but we have Nephilheim casting a Sabbath and countering our communion with Marverni. All they really do is a couple major battlefield spells, Blood Rain, to reduce the morale of everybody on the battle. And then a couple leeches, throw out some relief to give our blood slaves some relief. And then we start spamming out hordes of skeletons with the gaijas over and over and over just to kind of turbo communion our way into a boatload of skeletons. And a bunch of skeletons who don't suffer from morale with blood rain pounding out will eventually most likely win with just morale routes. So let's take a look. got the howl off we got some despair going getting our morale focus already blood rain just got cast bunch more hordes of skeletons and despair to work on the morale they're getting group regen over here and weapons of sharpness we're getting more hordes of skeletons and more despair we just cast harm which thumped a bunch of people in here and now you're seeing the tide is not collapsing so much against Nephil. They're even getting soldiers of steel. But we're throwing out Aura of Bewilderment. We're making it so people are afraid to attack us. Can't hit us. We just cast Bloodletting. Bloodletting hurts. Look at this. Look at this difference. Let's speed it up a little. A little more bloodletting. But we're, you see we're winning the morale battle now with all the despair, bloodletting, and undead who don't care at all.
So he suffered a couple losses, but look at this turbo communion spamming out the hordes of skeletons. Look at that. We just keep going. We just keep going. This is the power of a turbo communion. Arverni lost, 400 troops down. None of the Neeful Giants died this time. A couple of the Bondies, a couple of the Herdmen, a bunch of the light infantries, but none of the important expensive troops died. Our werewolves, obviously, in our Turbo Communion survived. Our gaijas all survived. So you can see with a Turbo Communion, you don't have to worry about anybody dying because these werewolves are regenerating so many hit points per turn that you're good to go. All right, guys, and now a really quick breakdown of the basic, basic Communion setup. Let's say we have a gentleman such as this right here, Velatiacus. He has level three earth magic. So if we start looking through our spells and we want to see what kind of earth spells he can cast. Ooh, there's army of bronze. Let's see if this is something we'd want to cast on the whole battlefield. You know, three earth gems. If we want him to cast this level six earth spell, there's only a couple ways we can do it. One, if you spend one gem during the casting of a spell, you can treat your path as being one higher. So he could cast any fourth level spell as a level three earth mage. So if you give him a gem, he needs three for the spell. You give him an extra one to treat him as higher level. And he will cast the spell that if it's fourth level now if you want to get him up to fifth level you could give him an item like earth boots you could give him an extra gem to get the fourth and then you could have him cast something like summon earth power which gives him plus one earth magic bonus and reinvigoration so let's say we have him cast an earth power we have him with an extra gem now he's getting up to level five earth magic but remember the spell that we're looking at casting here is 300 fatigue that's going to do boatloads of damage to him and it's going to knock him unconscious for effectively the rest of the battle. One thing we can do to reduce the fatigue as well as raise his effective spell casting level is a basic communion. Remember, if we have two communion slaves for this gentleman, we're going to get a one spell path boost. So he'll be treated as level four earth, level two water, level three astral if we get him two slaves. So let's do this. This is exactly how I would build communions if I was a beginner to it. I would take my major mage, I would look at the spell I want, spell level six, I would say, okay, how do I get him up to six from three? Summon Earth Power gets us up to four. An extra gem treats us like five, but that's only for one spell. But that's okay, we only need it for one spell. And now to get from five to six, we need two slaves. So let's just pick two random slaves. Let's say this gentleman cast communion slave. Copy that, put it there. Now we have two communion slaves. So we have a slave, we have another slave, and we put our master behind and like that. So now it's easy to keep track of in your head. You've got a master here, you've got two slaves here. Think of it like this building pyramid. Like if you add another master, you might want to add another slave. Add another master, might want to add another slave and add more if you need more for fatigue. But the thing to think about is this spell that we're looking at costs 300 fatigue. So if we have only three people in this communion, Let's remove this. Let's say summon earth power now, since they're slaves, will boost both of their paths. So they'll get three earth, three earth. He'll get four earth. And then he'll go up to five earth because of his two slaves. So now you look at this easy, short little communion slave. He's up to five power. But when he casts this 300 fatigue spell, he's barely going to be level six when he's casting it. So they're all going to take the full 300 fatigue. If you remember the formula for fatigue for the master is always the fatigue cost of spell divided by the total number of slaves. And then the master's fatigue is always like master fatigue plus armor penalties, stuff like that. Whereas the slave fatigue basically gets really, really bad if the slave doesn't have at least half of your master's path because these two will be only up to earth three, but they, it only care, compares the base path of the master. So if you look at that, that means since the master Master is higher than the slave, the slaves take double fatigue. Not four times, but double. We're going to have, out of 300, if you look at these three guys, we're going to have him take 100, him take 100, him take 100. Now he's going to get 200 and he's going to get 200 because of the doubling of, from fatigue. They're going to start taking damage immediately. So we probably want another way to reduce the base fatigue. If we add another couple communion slaves, remember if we have two communion slaves, we get plus one to all paths. If we have four communion slaves, we get plus two. Let's add in another slave and another slave slave. Let's actually add a slave with a different earth path. Now what's going to happen? Now we have these four slaves and this one master. What's going to happen is the 300 base fatigue is going to be split between one, two, three, four, five people. So it's 60 fatigue each. These guys are going to get double fatigue because they're three out of six. This guy is less than half because he's only going up to earth two. So what's going to happen is he's going to get four times the fatigue. So from 60 up to 240, he's going to take some damage. These guys are only going up to 120, 120, 120. And this guy's only going to be taking 60 that keeps our master alive so then let's say now that we've done that we can pound out 
exactly what we want to. So we can do the Army of Bronze. And then we can follow it up with another big Earth spell that might help us out. So let's see what else we're looking for. It's Legions of Steel. This affects the entire battlefield. Plus three protection to all worn armor parts. So let's just do Legions of Steel. Now what we're going to do is Communion Master, Earth Power, Bronze, and Steel. And the first one's going to give 60 Fatigue, 120, 120, 120. And here he's going to get 240 and take a point of damage. And then what's going to happen is we're going to have him cast Legions of Steel, which if you look is 100 Fatigue, but it's level 4 Magic Path, and he's treated like level 6 Magic Path now. So if we're looking at this, the formula for Spell Fatigue is 1 divided by 1 plus the sum of the Mage's Path level minus the minimum path. So the minimum path in this spell is four. Our path level is six. And so six minus four is two. So we're going to end up with one divided by three. So one third of the normal spell. Fit. Instead of having 100 fatigue, we're basically sitting at 33 fatigue. And then we're going to split that 33 fatigue five wages, which is about six fatigue each. Now remember, it's a level four earth spell. This fatigue is going to be six for him. It's going to be 12, 12, 12, and 24 fatigue. So this guy's going to be hurting, but the others are going to be just fine with 130 something. And remember from summon earth power, they're each getting four additional reinvigoration per turn. So that's five per turn off. They're actually going to recover from this pretty easily. So we went from crippling a guy and taking him out of the fight, easily being able to cast just by giving up the other four mages. Now here's the thing you have to compare, however. What if instead I just had these guys cast summon earth power each, and then they're all spamming group stone skin, group iron skin. One of them put, busts out marble warriors. That's the thing you really have to compare. If you have small enough group that 20 area of effect will cover them, it might actually be worth it for you to just have each of these guys cast. Because remember this, the one weakness in Dominions 5 is when your mage hits what point? Right here. When your mage has finally done his last, let's say he wants to do ground army at the very end. What's he going to do for his sixth action? Well, you don't know. That's where Illwinter has that horrific mage AI that comes in and just starts doing random things. And you really don't want to be depending on that. And that's the problem is you've just given up five spell slots, five spell slots, five spell slots, and five more spell slots that you could be planning out for your encounter. So do not, and trust me when I say do not use communions unless you really need to get out some battlefield wide spell or something that determines what happens in the battle. Because you'd be like, for example, if we put this guy in a communion and instead told him to start casting body ethereal point buffing, or he started casting evocations like, you know, not Starfires, but like Stellar Cascades or something to fatigue people, you would probably be better off having each of them cast Stellar Cascades five times instead of having one guy with lower fatigue casting it over and over. Big, big, big difference. Make sure you weigh the pros and cons. And this is exactly how I would build all of your communions. Even in that big battle where I showed you ridiculous communions that weren't well thought out, but they showed you exactly what they could do. Start with your master, find how many slaves you need, to make that master spell work and set him up in a way that you'll remember something like this. So you remember, hey, they're working together. And then you know what? Come over and go, hmm, I also want a big astral spell. So here's my other master. He's going to also cast communion master. And then what else do I want to cast? Let's say I want to cast will of the fates. So now he's also going to cast Will of the Fates, which is another 200 fatigue cost for a five astral spell. He's going to be treated like three, four, five, so he'll be able to cast it. But these guys are only going to go up to one, two, two, two. So they're definitely going to be treated like less than half. So they're going to take four times the fatigue. These guys are going to get annihilated. That's when you start, when you start getting a couple of mages casting big spells, it starts becoming prohibitively fatiguing for you to cast too many spells. That's when you start adding in more slaves. If we add in another slave, even if he doesn't have good path, he's going to take more fatigue from your master so your master can cast more spells. This is where spells get dangerous. Now, if you had, say, this guy cast Communion Master instead of Will of the Fates, let's say he casts Personal Regen. Now you've got this guy casting Personal Regen on himself after he does the Communion Slave or the Communion Master. He will be able to cast Personal Regen and then all of these guys will be hit by Personal Regen and Earth Power. It starts making them regenerate that damage that they're spamming with fatigue. Another trick I want you guys to pay attention to is if you're really in a hard spot where you know you're going to run into trouble let's say you've calculated out you know just a rough calculation hey we need these five four slaves here and fifth slave here we need them all to becoming slaves so there's our extra slave just to make sure he can cast the spell without killing everybody we need him to cast personal regeneration and then we want him to cast let's cast power of the spheres because that'll buff every spell for everybody else and then after that we want to cast some big spell let's say we're going against a bunch of you know magic creatures magical creatures cast this massive you know arcane domination let's just pretend we can cast it we can't 
can't because we haven't gotten up to, I think it's seven. Yeah, seven astral. But let's say we wanted to do a massive one. One thing you can do to make sure that your mages don't die at the end of battle, because what if, what if you do, let's say you don't do arcane domination. You just do this. He's just a buffer to buff all your troops. And then your other master casts a couple big spells. But then let's say after that, he casts earth meld. He's just spamming earth meld. Well, when they hit this point and they start casting spells on their own, they can get your slaves killed by continuing to spam cast because their magic paths are so high. He might just decide that instead of Earth Meld for the fifth spell or the one that you can't dictate, he's going to start, start spamming giant strength warriors or weapons of sharpness on people, and he might fatigue your slaves out and kill them all. One trick you can use at the very end of all this, give this gentleman a bow of any kind, and then at the very end you tell him fire. He will start shooting his bow and he will stop shooting. This is a really good trick, not for your major guys, generally speaking. Speaking, but for your buff guys, you could just have this guy pop into the communion, cast personal regen, power of the spheres to make sure all your troops, let's see if there's any other personal spells he wants to cast. So let's say you have this guy just cast a couple buffs and then you want him to stop casting because you don't want him draining the fatigue anymore. Give him your bow and just tell him to fire at the end of it. This way, this mage will jump in as a communion master, cast the buffs that you want, and then he'll let this master cast all the spells he wants and spam them out afterwards and start annihilating people for you. But you'll only have one master using up the fatigue max of all of these slaves. But try to set that up and this is is the way I recommend you do it. You take your master, set him aside, take, hey, look, now I get plus one to my path. Okay, that's not going to be enough. Now I want plus two to my path. That's not going to be enough. Let's say I want raise my path one more. We're going to need four more. We don't have them. So let's just pretend these guys are more communion slaves. <laughs> this looks hilarious. So now you go, okay, here's plus one to my path. Here's plus two. Here's plus three. Then if you need to add another eight, you know, to get to 16, you would add another eight right here and just keep track of what you need. So I would even do this. Just show how it keeps building and getting exponentially bigger. You just want to show yourself that every time you have a master that you want to cast a certain spell you just build up to it let's say he only needs level six so he only needs earth power to get the four and then he only needs plus two to get the six you only want these guys so don't put these extra guys in. Keep it simple if you can. Then when you start adding other mages to cast things, maybe this guy's just a buffer. You don't need more than this with just a buffer. You're good to go. So just leave it like this. Two masters, four slaves, and then this guy starts shooting his bow after. Trust me when I say, keep it simple. If you guys want a more complicated communion setup, I'm happy to show it to you, walk you through, and... Put all the formulas on screen. In fact, I'm going to put all the formulas on screen now for a couple of seconds just to let you guys see exactly what formulas I'm always working with and how I keep it simple in my head. And finally, what we want to look over is the items you can forge. Under miscellaneous, you have these things called Sky Metal Matrix, which is Earth and Astral, makes you a communion master, and a slave matrix makes you a communion slave. You can put these on people that are not even astral casters and they can join in your communions. Very good to abuse items like this, especially when you're looking at blood because the thing that's funny is if you look at this communion master spell it costs fatigue of 20 right off the bat not that bad communion slave fatigue of 20 but that means all your mages are starting at 20 if you put that item on you do not get that 20 fatigue the item does it for you and the reason that's very 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 important is because when you're looking at sabbath master look at that fatigue 100 he will knock himself right out casting this spell and the casting time takes longer than you want same thing with the Sabbath Slave. Look, 100 fatigue and a Blood Slave required. How much nicer is that to actually have somebody forge an item that enables you to just jump right in? Here's the Slave's Heart item that gives you an automatic Sabbath Slave and bonus morale, but that's kind of irrelevant. The Sabbath Slave. And here's the Master's of Fame Dagger, which makes you a Sabbath Master right off the bat. Admittedly, this is much nicer because it doesn't hit you with a chest wound, but when you go in here and you put a slave's heart on all your slaves and you put a, an athame on all of your masters, it makes it way easier for blood. This is a huge blood trick. First of all, because you're not that limited in how many blood slaves you usually have if you have a good economy, but also because it saves you that 100 fatigue. It's a big difference because otherwise, what you need to do is you need to script one of your guys right after they cast Sabbath Master to immediately cast the blood spell called Reinvigoration, which removes all of his fatigue because it'll remove 100 fatigue from your master and it will also remove 100 fatigue from all your slaves. However, the problem is it doesn't remove fatigue from your other masters. So your masters can actually get kind of stuck sitting there punching out these spells if you don't actually use those items. I highly, highly recommend these items. And remember, it's single-handed weapon. You can hit B if you want to see blood weapons. And then masters 
Athame, Fame. These are highly recommended for this. You may not want to do it for the slaves because slaves' hearts can get pretty expensive. And it gives you, I believe, a chest wound when you put it in somebody. Actually, let me double check that right now. Yeah, so when you check this slave's heart first of all it can't be removed it gives you plus 10 morale but you don't care about that and then what it gives you is unfortunately plus five encumbrance so it becomes much harder to manage your fatigue in the long run on your sabbath so it's really tough for blood mages it's a little harder but that's because blood slaves are a little easier to come by trust me when i say at the very least i wouldn't in fact i wouldn't even recommend this for the slaves even though it speeds it up because the problem now is let's say you don't do the slave's heart but if you did the masters of fame for the masters they will jump into sabbath master with zero casting time and then it makes your scripts a lot harder because if you're looking you're going to have now a master hopping in and spamming spells that they need the the group for so if you cast let's say take away sabbath master and you just start spamming horde of skeletons no problem because that won't mess up the horde of skeletons you'll get a big amount of fatigue for the first one but remember this spell takes a long time to cast so you're going to get at least one spell off if it's a low cast time spell before you even have the slaves boosting your pads so just be very careful with that trust me guys when i say don't get into communions and sabbaths unless you really need to it's not because i don't think you're capable of it you definitely are especially with this guide but you really just don't need them unless you're trying to cast something that you otherwise absolutely cannot cast if you just have a mage with a high enough path that you can boost it higher to cast the spell that you want it is always super efficient compared to just have that high level mage even if you have to put boots on you know I wouldn't go so far as to empower their path, but if you put boots on them, another item on them, give them an extra gem to cast it, you're going to be so much faster casting that spell that it's better a lot of times just to have that one mage lean into the spell really hard, cast it, pass out from fatigue, and then you have your other four or five, you know, slaves spamming spells instead. Because if you don't think five of these guys running around decimating in melee combat can do more than just standing around as Sabbath slaves, pff, you really got another thing coming. Also, guys, I almost forgot explaining the turbo communions here. So generally speaking, as I showed you earlier in my regular communion guide, you want to find your master. You want to set your master out. You want to say, what level death do I want, for example? Hmm. Let's look under death spells. Let's find a highest level death spell we can possibly cast. Well, right now it's only four. Let's say we wanted to cast darkness. 275% casting time, 400 fatigue cost. Obviously way too high for this lady to cast on her own. However, if we first make her a Sabbath master, then she's going to be able to cast darkness. When you set up your communion like this, where you have your one master, you say, hmm, how do I boot? How many times do I have to boost my path to get to the darkness path four? Well, I need to boost it by one. So let's get my two slaves. Let's put them here. Let's get another slave and let's put him here. There we go. We boosted it by one. We have our little communion path here where we've got one mage and we've got two people that are following in the path. This will boost our mage to four. That means she'll take the, the 400 fatigue cost here, split it three ways. In fact, you might want to add in a third just to get the numbers easy so I don't have to do math. And now you're basically doing a 400 fatigue split four ways is 100. Now for her, obviously, her death is four. And so she's going to take just 100 fatigue. But her slaves have no death. So they're going to take four times that. They're going to take 400 fatigue each. There's really no way to buff her slaves enough so that they don't take a ton of damage. However, what you can do is you can make it so these guys regenerate so much HP per round, they don't care. That's one thing we set up here. We gave them extra hit points to get their hit points up from 53 to 61 to break that checkpoint to get six HP per round. So we're looking at 10% giving us seven HP. So seven HP times we have regen here and we have base regen on this chassis. We're looking at 20% base regen. That means we're getting 14 hit points per round for this guy. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to have one of our Sabbath masters cast personal regen. Now these guys are gonna be regenerating 40%. We have the ring of regen, we have the base, we have the personal regen, and then I just made up another 10% that doesn't exist. So we're going back to 30%. So 30% of this seven is going to be 7, 14, 21 per round. That's a lot of hit points. So if we have a lot of hit points regenerating on these guys, every time their fatigue's over 200, they're going to take one point of damage, plus it's another point of damage for every 50 spell fatigue cost. This hurts. So if you give them another 100 spell fatigue, let's say the first spell gives them, you know, 400 fatigue. That means you're going to take hit 200 fatigue, and then they're going to take damage after that. So they're taking one point of damage after 200. And since you got 200 more after that, that's four extra damage. That means they're taking five damage right off the bat for that darkness spell. 
five damage could kill quite a few monsters. However, these guys have a ton of hit points. So now that we're regenerating 21, theoretically, we could cast Darkness forever if we had the gems to maintain it, and they would never die because they'd out-regen the damage. And that's what people call Turbo Communions. Now, the trick with Turbo Communions is, you guessed it, the damage from Fatigue does not skyrocket that quickly. It's not a one-to-one. -one. So let's say we have one mage casting Darkness. We have another mage casting Regen. But then let's say this mage we wanted to cast some high-level nature spells. Let's say Army Regen. How much fatigue is at 300 that 300 is going to give us basically three points of damage to each of our guys so we just did five points of damage then three points of damage they're taking eight even if we were spamming both of those it wouldn't hurt so this is where the turbo communion comes in where you put a lot of masters working with very few slaves and you just make sure your slaves out regen the damage your masters put them under because that way we can have a ton of masters pounding the enemy army with spells and you only have three slaves or you know maybe you need another one because you're doing the math of it and you're like oh i need a fourth slave out here but the thing is all of the fatigue is still being divided by how many slaves you have plus one for the master so six so this fatigue is always six but a lot of times they have different paths so these guys are just taking a boatload of fatigue but you don't care because once you go over 200 it's only one extra damage per 50 fatigue so you can actually do the math and calculate out exactly how much fatigue these masters are getting per round on these slaves and make sure that these slaves are out regenerating it. Or one of my favorite things to do, you can have, let's say we've calculated out, let's see how many of these mages we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's say we have seven of these gaijas casting massive spells every turn. Let's say it's not blurred body, personal luck, none of this gibberish. Let's say we're just spamming normal spells like uh like normal big spells like hell power or blood rain or rush of strength or anything like that we're spamming a bunch of high fatigue spells over and over right if you have seven masters if you only hit 200 fatigue then that means every 50 fatigue after that is only two points of damage for each of your slaves so you could theoretically have each one of these guys casting 50 fatigue and i'm talking 50 fatigue to the slave calculate that out you would be able to punch these slaves with like 20 points of damage every round and they would still out regen it with their 21 health regen but that's something that's really powerful because if you actually do the math correctly on this your gaijas can keep spamming spells out and especially once your gaijas get off script you know what gaijas are going to spam off script if they have a high death spell they're going to start spamming horde of skeletons they're going to start spamming this crap since their death magic is treated let's see we have four slaves so we're treated like we have death magic of three plus two five so we're going to be casting eight of these per gaija per cast we're going to be flooding the battlefield and the gaijas themselves are never going to fatigue out because remember that's only a spell that is 40 fatigue if you have only level two death magic you have level five death magic so if you go back to our formula you're looking at five minus two which is three plus one you're taking one fourth of the fatigue you're only taking 10 fatigue per cast now your slaves are getting docked by it because remember this your slaves take way more fatigue but they also in a blood sabbath they take 20 percent bonus fatigue so just remember that but your sabbath masters are going to be able to spam 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 werewolves are going to out regen it and so you're going to be sitting there just unlimited basically unlimited spell casting resources so keep that in mind now we're going to go over the brief differences between the different types of communions when we show you a sabbath the sabbath the big thing that sets the sabbath apart in terms of just the sabbath in general is that in a sabbath the caster takes half as much fatigue as normal okay so instead of that 10 fatigue on our example with horde of skeletons with four slaves we're going to instead take half that we're going to be taking five fatigue which is great because sabbaths are kind of like you know take care of the master screw the slave in the sabbath kind of it's kind of fitting but then all the slaves take 20 percent bonus fatigue which kind of makes sense, right? In the blood magic, they don't really care about the slaves, obviously. It's not like a, oh, let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Now, in a normal communion, everything's 25% longer casting time, so it just slows down your casting, which is why I was saying a lot of times with low-level evocations, it's better just have good mages spamming the evocations by themselves instead of joining a communion to do so. In Middle-Aged Man, there is a chorus it's a choir that they set up that is basically the exact same as normal communions, except it's 25% longer casting time. And whenever your slaves become unconscious at 100 fatigue, they leave the chorus. 
It makes it super easy for brand new beginners because the slaves basically prevent you from murdering them. But the problem is a lot of communion mastery comes from being able to do like what we're doing in this turbo communion where we're keeping the slaves alive no matter what to power the masters like batteries. Or in a communion when you get them to low fatigue then you cast, you know, reinvigoration or you cast relief or something to relieve a lot of the fatigue on them. And then you start it all over again. It gives you a second round. If you have a choir, they start if they ever hit 100 fatigue because you miscalculate something, let's say you're in a hot province and you are cold focused or you're in a cold province and you're hot focused or you're neutral and you're in a warm temperature or a drain province, all of a sudden your slaves might hit 100 fatigue, bail out of your communion, and now your communion masters cannot get off those major communion spells. It's very dangerous in my opinion. So as funny as it is, I hear a lot of people talking about how the middle-aged man choirs are safer. Also, on that note, choirs are not restricted only to middle-aged man. There's a summon that you can do the summon of harbingers i think marignon can do it and also seraphs i think both of them are able to jump into choirs as well but the main thing is with ma man everybody that i've seen so far on youtube kind of says hey ma man is great to do choirs because they knock themselves out well i don't think so i think it's actually harder to do communions with choir because all of your slaves just bail. It's kind of like having a bunch of friends go in on a deal with you and then they bail at the first sign of trouble. They hit 100 fatigue. They're like, later, I'm out. What if the opponent casts Curse of Stones? What if, you know, how are you supposed to calculate that? And it makes, it makes the problems with the communion even worse. So I don't recommend that. I would stick to normal communions or Sabbath if possible. Obviously, if you're a middle-aged man, go for it. It's all you got. It's very difficult to pull a communion for anybody. All right, guys, try that stuff out. If you have any questions, put them down below in the comments, and I'll try to respond to you. This was designed just to be a real short, quick, easy communion one, and now I'm going to put up my little info card to try to show you guys all the math that I'm working with on this so you can have an easy click-on guide if you forget anything. All right, now seriously guys, don't show anybody this trick. This is what you call a perfect communion setup. I have made a guide, so you know I'm perfect at setting these things up. So we are gonna show our absolute dominance with our communion masters right here against a huge army of maenads, flyers, even a god. This communion is going to rule the world. Perfectly scripted, perfectly planned, perfectly thought through. The definition of perfection. Army of Shades. Gift of the Serpent. Barkskin. Absolute perfection on display. Up, uh, up. Uh. What? No. No. What? Uh. Uh. You saw nothing. 